When I was reading the gospel text today, standing here, you all were united in your listening to the word being proclaimed uh, through the scripture. And I was thinking in my mind, what a really difficult and challenging text this is, uh, in which uh, a very wealthy young man, with all good intentions, having been obedient his whole life uh, to, to the commandments and to the way of life within the Jewish community, throws himself for, before Jesus and asks a simple question, how do I get in heaven? How do I receive or inherit eternal life? Uh, only to be told that he has to get rid of everything. Uh, and he walks away, unable to, to disconnect himself from the things that are possessing him. I mean, it's so troubling that the disciples even kind of get a little agitated, don't they? I mean, they turn to Jesus and they say, how can this possibly be? Nobody can possibly live that kind of life. Give everything away. What are you talking about? Now, it's kind of a humorous statement for, for me because they're talking to Jesus. Jesus, you know, Jesus, who doesn't have a home or any possessions. I mean, they're saying, how could this possibly be? Jesus is standing there. you got to think he's standing there thinking, uh, I'm kind of doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of living this way now. And, and even to the point where after Jesus responds and says, hey, what, you know, what's impossible for human beings is possible, made possible by God. I'm evidence of that. And yet Peter takes it a step further, doesn't he? He gets a little disgruntled. I, we all add our own tone when we read the scripture. I, I kind of picture him going, listen, we've left everything for you. House, family, children, our great fishing company. We've, we've left it all. And now you're saying it's impossible. It's, I, I mean, and Jesus kind of comforts them in the moment. You know, don't worry. Those who've made these great sacrifices for them, life, life. And that's good news. Still is an easy text. And as I was standing here reading it, and we got to the point where I said, this is the word of God for the people of God. And you all responded by saying, it just popped in my mind as, do we really mean that in light of this text? I mean, are we thankful that Jesus has called us to give everything away? Thank you, Jesus. Here's my Mustang, Molly. I'm giving it to you. You get it first. First we come last. Yeah, first we, well, yeah. Uh, my, my, my house ain't going my house. Um, no. Or maybe my paycheck. I just write a couple paychecks over to whoever I want. Thanks be to God. Praise Jesus. I mean, are you all thankful? Now, we're really quick to be thankful for the things we've received. Oh, Lord, thank you that we live in Naples, Florida, in the beautiful Naples, Florida. Thank you, Lord, that our seasonal residents have come back to be with us. Thank you, Lord, uh, that traffic is getting more packed as the season. Thank you, Lord, that I have a house and, and, and a car, not just one car. I have, we have four cars. Thank you, Lord, that we have all flat screen TVs now. <laughs> I can't even go to a hotel where they don't have a flat screen TV anymore. If I walk in the room and it's an old tube TV, I immediately go down and say, what's the deal? <laughs> no HD in this hotel? And you're charging me $175 a night? Upgrade, people, upgrade. I can't look at the grainy screen. I need flat screen with HD, amen? I'm thankful for those things. I'm thankful for the fact that whenever I want a cup of coffee, I can drive through the drive-thru at Dunkin' Donuts, throw them $2.11, amen? <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Yet that's not what the text is talking about. It. I mean, he's, I mean you know, it's, it's, it's a crazy, difficult text. When, and, and, and most churches, and even in my own life, sometimes we've wanted to kind of dumb it down a little bit, make it softer. Well, Jesus isn't talking about literally giving everything up. It's kind of figurative. He's talking about the sacrifices we make in our lives and how we need to be disconnected. In other words, 
if I don't really, am I not really willing to give up my car, you know, that kind of thing, if I, or, or if, I, if I'm attached to my car that much, or am I not attached to my car that much? You know, softening it a little bit. But the reality is Jesus means give everything up. You heard that, right? He's saying that uh, in order to be a follower, you have to give everything up. I mean, the young man, kneeling down before he's done everything right. He's followed all the rules. He's obeyed all the commandments. His checklist is almost complete. He has one little box left. He goes and kneels before Jesus because he knows this is the great teacher. And if the great teacher gives him justification, then he's going to be all right. In other words, he doesn't have to worry anymore. All this work throughout his life about being a good Jew and following the rules has all paid off. Because now, since he's been obedient son of Israel, he throws himself before Jesus. All he needs is Jesus' Episcopal blessing. You can go to heaven, my son. He's entitled to that, isn't he? And isn't that the way we view our faith? Is we're entitled to something. We follow Jesus. We're just like Peter. Listen, we've given up. Not a whole lot, but we've given up some things. We've given up some things to follow you, Jesus. Hey, we went to the altar. Remember that a few years ago? I went to the altar. I was crying. And I said, come into my life, Lord Jesus. And you came. Praise be to God, you came. And then I went out and I was free to do the same things I was doing before. Because I'm no longer bound to my sin, but you gave me forgiveness, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that. Mm, now it's getting really sticky in here. Isn't it? It's the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Kinda. Kinda. I mean, Jesus knows it's tough. I mean, the disciples are all caught up. They're off guard. They're all worried. How could this possibly be? Jesus goes to this great image. You know, it's more difficult for a rich person uh, to get into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to cross through the eye of a needle. Impossible, right? I got news for you. This is the way my brain works. I spent most of the week trying to figure out how I could get a camel through the eye of a needle. I, I thought about every angle. I thought about if I had like a reduction ray, I could shrink the camel down. It's possible, you know. The one we got to take the filter off and shrink it down, you know. Be like uh, Willy Wonka, you know. Pass the camel through the idea. I thought, oh, that's kind of out there. You know? But physics today answer a lot of problems. You might be able to be able to do it. But then I thought, I remembered back when I was in middle school, and I was sitting in social studies class with. Uh, Mr. Kermit Cambridge. Anybody went to Gulfview Middle School? Uh, Kermit Cambridge was the associate teacher there. And I was sitting in class listening very intently to his teachings when I noticed all the way across the room there was this kid and he was looking at me. And I looked over and I saw him and he had his hand up and he was doing this. He said, I was squishing your head. <laughs> Aha! So I took a needle, and I was standing right next to him. It wouldn't fit through, would he? But if I walk back, he gets smaller and smaller and smaller plants. You get the point? Just maybe if I get that camel, if I move, move myself from that camel and I get far enough back that my perspective changes, then the camel's small enough that I can slip in through the eye of a needle. Now I know he can't, it's not physically moving through the eye of a needle, but I can put him through the eye of a needle. Then I got to thinking about all of our stuff and our possessions. 
and how attached and connected we are to those things. And how those things, that stuff, those possessions become so big in our lives that we lose perspective. And they dominate everything about us to the point where we don't have a life anymore. Because we're paying mortgages and car payments and worrying about our 401k and all those things that have become so important in the midst of the world that they become big. They kind of sit in the midst of the room to the point where we can't even move around anymore. I remember going to a beach house with a group of friends of mine. Beautiful house, mansion on the beach, beautiful porch looking over the ocean. We're sitting out on that porch and we're looking out and it was cool and breezy and the sun was out and the seagulls were ee, ee, ee. You know, it was just a glorious day and my friend turned and said this is the life and I thought this is the life because we don't have to pay for it <laughs> you all know that big thing sitting in the midst of your room the stuff the possessions, the things that you have made so important. Maybe we need to remove ourselves from that stuff. Walk away from it. Until it becomes small again. And just maybe, by removing ourselves from all that stuff that we thought was so big and important, and it becomes small, we gain some new perspective. In other words, what we thought was benefiting our lives, maybe it's not. What we thought was so important in this world, maybe it's not that. The cars, the houses, the degrees, the retirement plan, the health insurance. Yeah, it's all got its place in this, this crazy world. But it's not the thing that gives us life. Jesus enters into the midst of our existence to offer himself in relationship. It's the relationship that makes the difference. It's not the commandments. It's not the rules. It's the relationship. He calls us to turn away from all the stuff that we've made so important so that it can be small again to realize that the things that are really important in this world are really deeply rooted in relationship. Not just with God, but through the life that God has to offer us through Jesus Christ, we now have the opportunity to be in relationship with each other. And it's not just stuff, cars, monies, houses, all those types of things that gets in the way. It's also our use of time, isn't it? I mean, how many, uh, Steve Hart was in the early service, some of you know Steve, some of you don't, but Steve and I used to go get a cup of coffee all the time, just to sit down, hang out, talk. And I asked him, I said, how often have we gone to get a cup of coffee this year? And he said, once. Because both of us have become so busy. We call, we say, hey, you know, we need to get a cup of coffee. Or how about this, Lisa Stephanie, how often do we get a cup of coffee nowadays? Rarely. Rarely. And I ask myself, is the stuff that I am missing, this coffee opportunity, more important than getting together with Stephanie and Lisa? No. But I've let it become so big. Maybe I need to remove myself, step away, so that just possibly I might be able to get the camel through the eye of the needle. What brings me hope is that Jesus kind of gets that we're all caught up in this and realizes that in order to be liberated and set free, it might appear to be an impossibility, but then offers us hope. Through God, everything's possible. We just have to change our perspective to the glory of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.